Thank you so much for streaming our latest message from First Baptist Church. Here at FBC, our mission is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. We do that by thinking big, thinking small, thinking in, and thinking out. We hope that this message helps you as you continue to grow in your faith. If you would like to stay connected to FBC, you can visit our website at fbcloyd.ca, look us up on Facebook and Instagram, or download our free mobile app. Now here's the latest from FBC. Enjoy. Amen. Why don't you guys grab a seat? So some of you in the, this room who do not possess a Y chromosome were maybe at our ladies' retreat out at Pleasant View Bible Camp uh, this weekend. Uh, if you do have a Y chromosome, I certainly hope you weren't there. But um, awkward. Um, anyways, if you were there, uh, my wife, Talisi, was the speaker for the weekend, so you got to hear her speak, I think, four times. And um, so maybe you're like eagerly sitting there kind of like ready to compare and critique and be like, oh, who's speaking? Do I enjoy more? Uh, well, Darren and Neil were at the ladies' retreat. I have some serious questions. Um, well, you might think, well, it's not a competition, um, but it is. So um, if you think my speaking is more enjoyable than Talisi's, please make sure you let her know that. If you enjoy hers more, uh, no feedback necessary. You can just keep that to yourself. Take it to your grave. Um, anyways, I hope you were here last week. Uh, Doug kicked off this four-week series we're doing called It's Personal. If you weren't here, I would highly recommend you go on our Facebook or YouTube uh, channel or our app or podcast or the kind of 7,000 digital platforms we have that you can keep up with that and check out the message. It laid a really great groundwork and foundation for where we're headed in this series. Um, Doug, uh, Doug really dove into this idea of how personal our God is. And I mean, that's why at FBC we talk about thinking in, engaging personally with God, because we believe that that's not only beneficial, but it's actually possible that we can know God on a personal level level, that we can engage with him in a real, true relationship. Some people have this view of God that he's this, maybe he created things, but he's far off, distant being, kind of floating in the universe that we can't connect with, and that's actually a false worldview called deism. We believe that the God who created you loves you, and he likes you, and he wants to know you, and he does know about you, and he wants to have a relationship with you, and it's possible for you to dig into that and lean into that and actually know him well. And this kind of undergirds the whole mission that we have here at FBC. Our mission, if you've been here for a while, you know is to lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. A relationship that you have that's, that you, where you know God and he knows you, but it, that's growing, where you grow in intimacy, you grow in the knowledge of who God is and you understand more what it means to know him. And uh, that's kind of really what we're all about. So series, it's personal, is kind of a great treatment of really what, we're, what, what we have here simply as our mission at FBC. Now this series is uh, based off of a book uh, right here. The book is called It's Personal. Um, and uh, it's a really short read if you ever want to pick it up. Um, so it, makes it, it doesn't take very long unless you're a really slow reader that maybe takes a little longer. But a short book, great book. And uh, it's written by three authors. And one of them, his name is Reggie Joyner. And you, you might know who Reggie Joyner is. Uh, if you volunteer at FBC Kids, he is the guy who founded and runs a president, CEO, I don't know what you call the head honcho of Orange. And they, Orange is this organization in the States that puts out the curriculum that we use at FBC Kids. And actually, not only the curriculum, but there we use the Orange strategy and how we run FBC FBC Kids and kind of what our goals and how we go about things in that ministry area are. So Reggie's this great thinker, and this book, what it does is it's set up in a way, it has a couple extra chapters, but the five main chapters are built around these five questions. When it comes to making it personal with people, when it comes to actually developing intentional relationships where we take this relationship we have with God that is highly personal, and we personalize the mission, and we personally take that to people, we make it that personal, there are five questions that are very important to answer, and these, this book unpacks them. And Doug was focusing on the first question last week, and that question is, do you know my name? Now, this is foundational to making it personal, to intentionally having personal relationships with people. I mean, if you don't know someone's name, they're mostly invisible to you, right? It's easy in this world to feel invisible to others. I mean, if someone is just, oh yeah, he's my neighbor, I don't know his name, or she's my coworker, or he's the guy that, whose locker is beside mine in school or whatever, 
I mean, if they know that that's how you refer to them and you don't know their name to, to you to, or to them, they're invisible to you. I mean, if I were to go to someone and be like, hey, this person who doesn't know your name, you guys pretty tight, they'd be like, well, apparently not. Um, and, and, you know, we, we're not going to know everyone's name in the world, but w- the first step in making it personal is to actually know someone's name, to know their identity, to, to, to recognize that they have a unique kind of fingerprint, unique DNA. They are who they are. Uh, the next question in this book is, do you know what matters to me? And this question asks, do you know what makes me tick? Do you know what energizes me? You know, if someone were to ask you, do you know what energizes me? Do you know what frustrates me? Do you know what brings fear to my life? Do you know what you know, freaks me out? Do you know what I like? Do you know what I'm into? Do you, do you know the things that are important to me? It's a big question for someone to ask you if you're really going to be personal with others. If you're going to engage in personal relationships, you need to understand what matters to people. And the third question is, do you know where I live? And so this takes it even a step further to be like, do you understand the people that you're growing close to, that you're building relationship and community with, do you actually understand like where, what's their context? Where are they at? Like where are they at economically? What's going on in their household? What's going on in their family? Now this is a four week series and the book asks five questions. So this week what I've done is I've really just condensed these two questions into one question and simply put, I've put, do you know where I'm coming from? And if we're going to be a church that's missional about reaching people with the love of Jesus Christ and then helping people grow in a relationship with Jesus Christ so that they can experience the love and goodness of the God who created them, this is an important question for us to be answering in the affirmative when we look at those that we're interacting with. We need to know where people are coming from, understanding what's their story. They have this unique story that's brought them to this point where they're at. They have a different cultural background than you. They're at a different spot financially. They have a different job. They have different interactions. Their family situation, maybe growing up or now, is different than yours. And we actually take time to understand where they're coming from. It's when we can really make this thing personal. So when we ask this question, what we're really looking at is we're looking at people's context. And context is such an important thing. I mean, if you've been around church for a while, you've heard people talk about context when studying scripture, reading the Bible. I mean, Context is kind of king when it comes to reading the Bible. I mean, people will take out a little verse and take it out of context and make it say whatever they want, but if you really put it into the context of what else is being written there, what's being said there, you start to understand, no, this is what the author really means. And even beyond that, if you go, if you lean in even further to the context of Scripture and you say, uh, well, you know, what was going on at that time? What was the cultural background like that? What was the occasion for the author writing this? I mean, if we could go back in time and sit down with Paul when he's writing one of his letters and say, Paul, what are you feeling when you're writing this? Like, what's going on in your world as you write this? Like, why are you choosing those words? We would have the best understanding of what's actually going on there. Now, that's true for scripture, but this is especially true for people. Our context defines how we hear things, how we perceive things, and how we interact with others. Our context is the filter through which everything we experience goes through. And when we really start to begin to understand people's context, it fosters a lot of really cool things. It starts to foster compassion and care. Now, let me give you an example here about uh, context. In kind of a, this is something that happened to me a few weeks ago. So a few weeks ago, I took my daughter Avra across the street to Kim's house, Barry's and Kim's house, and it was Kim, Paisley, and Gracie hanging out there. So we're hanging out, and Gracie and Avra are the little babies. They're not even two yet, and Paisley's old. She's like three. So she's got her big girl, uh, like princess frozen bike, and she's so proud of it. And the little babies are like trying to touch her bike and climb on. And she's like, No, 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 get away from my bike. You guys are, you guys don't know what you're doing. You're just little babies. And she's kind of pushing them away. And then, so she gets on her bike and she proudly shows me how she can pedal this bike and make it move. And then she can like pedal backwards. It's still one of those bikes and make it stop. And just this amazing thing. And I look at her and I say, Paisley, wow, you are such a big girl. Now for me to say that to her, to say, wow, you're such a big girl, Paisley. That means Paisley, you've learned things. You've like developed as a human. You have abilities and skills beyond what these pathetic little unlearned babies have. Like you are, you just moved 10 feet in a mere like seven hours on your bike. Like, wow, I applaud you for being such a big girl. This statement, wow, you're such a big girl is a serious compliment to her. Now take that same statement, don't change the tone, don't change the words, don't change anything, just change the context. Imagine a week later, Talcy and I were feeling like having a chill night. We're just like, we don't wanna, we don't wanna make supper. Well. 
she doesn't want to make supper. And so we're like, hey, let's just order a pizza, take it easy. You can imagine whatever f flavor you want. I'm picturing Papa John's barbecue chicken, that's my jam. And so the, the pizza comes, and we just sit on the couch, we start eating pizza, and we're eating till we're full, we've both had enough. But the pizza's so delicious. So Talisy decides, even though I'm full, she goes in for that extra piece, grabs that garlic butter dip that Papa John's has, dips it in, brings it to her mouth, and as she's doing that, taking that extra piece, I look at her and just say, Talisy, wow, you're such a big girl, right? <laughs> That couch that we're sitting on is now my bed for the night. <laughs> Actually, the couch in the basement's more comfortable, so I'd probably move there, but. Context matters so much, that's a silly example, but you know that what you're going through or what people have gone through changes how we understand and perceive what people are saying. I mean, if you don't understand how much context shape something, I'd encourage you to go on a missions experience sometime and go to a very different culture where the same jokes and statements and things we do and say and the ways we act are just different based on where people are coming from. We start to understand context. We start to be able to look at people with a greater degree of compassion and love and understanding. And ultimately, I think that understanding context, understanding where someone's coming from, gives us a good dose of something that I like to call empathy. Now, you might be sitting here and have a definition of empathy in your mind. You might be sitting here and say, well, I don't even know what that word means. Um, maybe like, I've learned that word, but I don't like it, so I've chosen to uh, delete it from my brain. Um, but I want to use a working definition that comes from this book that they wrote that I think is a really good definition. The way to define empathy in this book is they say empathy is pausing your own interests and opinions long enough to understand someone else's interests and opinions. Pausing your interests and opinions long enough to understand someone else's interests and opinions. This is hard. I mean, when I'm having a conversation with you, you just gotta know that as you're talking, I'm listening, but I'm often just thinking about what I'm saying next. What do I add to this conversation? How do I react? When I, or, or in our relationships, you know, I'm often thinking about, well, what do I do that I think makes sense to me? So often, I'm not pausing and saying, I wonder what this person needs in this conversation. Like, what am I, am I, where are they coming from? Why are they saying the things that they're saying? How can I understand that? Why are they doing what they're doing? It's so easy to just think, well, everyone should think like me. I mean, I've, I'm smart, I've got to figure it out. I know how to be a good human. And just under, expect that people would think the same way or have gone through the same things, but we understand that their context is different. It fosters empathy. And it makes it a lot more realistic for us to answer this question, do you know where I'm coming from? Now, I want to look at a couple examples of empathy, both from a lack of empathy and uh, also um, an abundance of empathy. And uh, first, we'll look at the lack, and then we'll, after that, we're going to turn to Luke 19. If you want to bust out your Bibles or your devices, it'll be on the screen, too. And we'll look at an example from Jesus, because, I mean, he's uh, awesome at showing empathy. He's, he's amazing at this. But I want to I want to look at it, a couple examples of what it looks like to lack empathy, and I've got a couple examples from our world. Now, we all know what it's like to be on the receiving end of a lack of empathy or compassion, right? Like, I mean, someone's not taking the time to understand what we're going through, and it's frustrating or what we're thinking, and it, it, it's hurtful. And I, I would wager to say, for sure me, but I'm guessing a lot of us have done that to others as well, where we've responded or we've treated people in a way that just makes sense in our mind without understanding where they're coming from, without extending the empathy and compassion and understanding, not, not pausing to think, maybe they're in a different place, in a different boat than I'm in. Now, um, I've got my awesome FBC gym bag here, free at the Info Center, along with our shopping bags and car decals and all that, lots of swag. Um, and I brought with me a couple examples, and I was thinking of a lack of empathy in the world. I, I thought of these two examples that came to my mind right away, and um, I'm sure you'll be able to relate. Well, I, I hope you'll be able to relate to, to where I'm coming from. And so, you know, it's so easy for people to just think about their values and goals and what they're aiming for and not think about mine. And so the first example, uh, this will be a familiar site for you guys, is this, this company right here, right? Lay's, you guys, Lay's fans? Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll say something positive about them first before I speak negatively about Lay's. So they're one of the largest uh, chip manufacturers in the world, and they've understood, they've extended empathy and understanding that I need sliced up, dehydrated, dried out, magically lives on the shelf forever, pieces of potato with magical flavors on them, right? I'm more of like an all-dressed or a ketchup fan, but I'm trying to eat a bit better, so uh, I went with salt and vinegar because they're Talisy's favorite, so that hopefully she'll just devour them and I won't touch them. But um, 
That's, that's my display of empathy right there. So um, they understand that I need good flavors in my life, so that's good. Here's where I think that they really fall short in extending empathy to us. So now, you, you go to the store, and you're like, yeah, I want some chips. You grab some chips off the, off the shelf, and you buy them, and then you take them home and open them, right? That is not actually what happens, right? If you're like us, they're like, you take them out of your grocery bag, they're between the seats on the way home. You're, or, or maybe you're like paying for your food. Yeah, yeah oh, credit, yeah, okay. Um, open these bad boys right away. Anyways, at some point, whether in the store or your van or home or whatever, you, uh, you open these chips and you look inside and what do you realize? You realize, yeah, Lay's might be one of the largest manufacturers of chips in the entire world, but they're also one of the largest sellers of air in the whole world, right? <laughs> when I buy a bag of chips this size, what Lay's isn't considering is that what I want is this many chips. I'm not like, oh, that's a good looking bag. I hope that it has like this much chips in it, right? And I, I find that frustrating. I mean, even their slogan, I think, is a real slap in the face, right? Bet you can't eat just one. It's like, well, have you looked inside? Because that might be my only option, is to eat <laughs> just one. And it's a ridiculous slogan because it's like, yeah, when's the last time you've gone to someone and been like, yo, I'm so hungry, I could eat a chip. You know, you don't invite someone over for supper and be like, here's your chip, here's your sip, chip, you know, enjoy, you know, like, if you need seconds, sorry, they're glutton, but... Um, so anyways, real lack of empathy. I'm, hopefully they watch this sermon video and they kind of change their ways. Um, the other one, now the other one, I want to be sensitive because I know everyone's gone through different things in this room and I don't want this to be like a trigger or anything like this because this one I think is a little bit more deep-rooted. This is kind of on the opposite end of the spectrum. But there's the company that makes these fruit cups, right? Exact opposite problem. Do they think that I buy this, go home, take my clothes off, hop in the bathtub, and be like, oh, okay, I'm gonna eat a fruit tub? It's like, I wanna eat and drink the beautiful, delicious tangerine juice, not wear it. I, I think that, a min, uh, that Ninja, American Ninja Warrior, after the salmon ladder, after all their events, right before that buzzer they have to hit, should just put one of these on the table and say, you open that without spilling it, you win. You're the, you're the champ, so. Anyways, these companies, are uh, not responding to my needs and interests. They're not, they just, I don't know, they wanna make, they, I don't know why Lay's and fruit cup companies don't just pair up and it's like, yo, give us some air, we'll give you some empty space, you know, so. <laughs> I know these are ridiculous examples, but you know what it's like when people don't stop and be like, what matters to you more than what matters to me? And here we get to look at Jesus do an excellent job of this. So Doug referenced this story of Zacchaeus last week. We're gonna read through it and dive in a little bit more. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. Now, I should notice something there. I'm going to make a few comments throughout. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. He's on his way somewhere. It doesn't say he's stopping in Jericho, and hopefully I'll remember. We'll come back to that idea later. He's on his way somewhere. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, and he was wealthy. If you've been around church for a while, you've heard about tax collectors in the Bible a bit. They're kind of the villains of the New Testament. People hate them. So what, in, in, this, in this ancient Jewish world, they're being kind of, they're, they've been imperialized by the Roman uh, government. And the Romans have gotten some Jewish people to collect taxes from the other Jewish people and give them to them. So they're like going out and getting people's money to give to the government. But usually they were dishonest in how they collected and they'd collect more and they'd skim some off the top. Now, this term here, chief tax collector, appears nowhere else in the New Testament. This is reserved only for Zacchaeus. He's, he's not just a tax collector. He's like top dog tax collector. Like, this is, I mean, he's high level. So if people hate tax collectors, they like, you know, it's like if in the, in the text somewhere, like people were called jerks throughout the New Testament, he's like super jerk or like ultimate jerk. And this, it's an interesting, I think Luke gives us quite a bit of information in this verse. He says, and he was... Wealthy. Well, why was he wealthy? Because he's ripping people off so effectively. So when people see Zacchaeus' nice house or see him pull up in a sports car, they'd be like, yeah, you know how he's paying for that? Out of our pockets. So here's a guy that no one likes. He, Zacchaeus, wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was so short, he could not see over the crowd. So I don't, I don't know how tall Zacchaeus was or not. Some scholars speculate that the average Jewish man back in that time was probably about five foot six, uh, so not super tall. So Zacchaeus was somewhere shorter to fill my imagination with the story. I just picture like a garden gnome that's come to life, just kind of running around in the crowd, wanting to see. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. So here he's, he's up in the nosebleeds. He's like, I gotta see this guy. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, 
Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. If you read through the Gospels, you start to realize, this is a series on the Gospel of Mark. Jesus says a lot of weird things. He, he doesn't care about social convention. And here's another good evidence of that. Like, you know, you don't ask your mom if your friend can sleep over, like right in front of the friend, you know? You don't ask your wife right after church today in front of your friend, hey, can they come over for, like, can these guys come over for lunch right in front of your wife? You know, like, there's, and you don't just go up to people and be like, hey, can I come over for lunch right now? Uh, you know, that's, and especially, I mean, you're Jesus. It's like, can I come over for lunch? Also, I got like 12 friends. It's like the hitchhikers who hitchhike, and then you're like, yeah, I'll give you a ride. And like, okay, bring out the dogs. And the yeah, and they're like, there are like 17 of us. You know, this is what Jesus is doing here. He's saying, I'm coming over to your house. But the reception is good. Zacchaeus came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. He's hanging out with Zacchaeus. Gross. They see it like when, celebrities or whatever, they, you know, they've got lots of followers and they're famous and people love them and all that, but then they, they do something like negative or they, they post, they tweet something, you know, political, but like the opposite way you'd expect, or they do something that, they, they commit some act that's like, oh, this is like not good. And what happens is their followers start unfollowing them and they're like, oh no, I, you know, they're like burning their Justin Bieber shirts. Like, no, I never, my, my parents bought this for me. I was never actually a follower. This is what's happening here. Jesus is famous. He's got a big crowd following him and listening to his teachings, but then he goes to this chief tax collector's house like scraping the bumper stickers off, the, their Jesus bumper stickers off their van. They're like, no, no, we, we weren't fans. Someone put this on as graffiti, you know? And they, they start complaining about this. They're like, Zacchaeus is the worst. Why is Jesus going to hang out with him? But Zacchaeus stood up. It should say, but no one really noticed because he was so short. And said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Oh, that's crazy. Here's this dude who's rich off of exploiting people, and he's like, I'm just going to give it all away. I, sometimes I try to do the math on that. I'm like, you're going to give away half and then pay people back four times? Like, I don't, I don't know if you have enough money for that. Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the son of man came to seek and save the lost. I'm not going to camp too much on that last verse there, the idea of Jesus coming to seek and save the lost, because uh, Doug was talking about last week, so you can, you can watch that if you want to hear a bit more about that. But I mean, this really is Jesus' mission. He's, he's looking for people, not just the people we'd expect, but people who don't know his love and his grace and his goodness. And he says, I, I, want, I want them to experience this. I, I want people to know my goodness, and I want them to grow in that relationship. I want to make a few observations about this. I want to compare Jesus to Zacchaeus. I mean, Zacchaeus is this guy who's selfishly exploiting people. He's taking from people and profiting from people's loss. He's selfishly becoming rich off of, like, other people's loss. And then here's Jesus, the, like, perfect savior who's come into the world to give and give and give until he gives his very life away to seek and save the lost. Zacchaeus is hated by everyone. I mean, he's famous. But that's because when people see him coming down the street, they take a different street. They, they'll avoid this guy as much as they can. Jesus, he's got a crowd following him. He's famous. People are listening to him. Zacchaeus, he's a sinner, and Jesus, he's perfect and without sin. I think about how I would interact with Zacchaeus, or maybe how most of us would interact with Zacchaeus if he was around nowadays, and someone told me about what he was doing, he's exploiting people like that. I would probably find it appropriate to sit around with you guys and be like, man, that guy's the worst, he's brutal. If I interact with him, I'd be like, Zacchaeus, like, you're a jerk, man, like, you're, you're such a dirtbag. What, who does this? Who exploits people like this, and who takes from them like this? Why would, why would anybody do that? Like, that would probably be, my inclination would be to have that kind of a posture against Zacchaeus. We don't have, like, the contents of Jesus' conversation. I mean, it's a pretty short narrative we read there. We don't know what the conversation was, but I'm going to guess that that wasn't what Jesus started with. Well, we know that he started by saying, hey, I'm going to come hang out with you, man. I'm going to come have lunch with you. I'm going to know where you live. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come into your context and hang out with you and spend some time with you. And I just wonder if maybe the fact that Jesus approached that conversation differently than I would have, or I'm assuming as people were then, or a lot of us would have, if that's why Zacchaeus went through such a crazy life transformation. I mean, picture someone. His whole life, he's been amassing all this wealth off of exploiting people and just saying, I'm just going to give it away. Yeah, it's, 
that's a big life. I mean, that's a big life change for any of us. And we're not exploiting people, right? Like for me, it's big. I'm just gonna give it all away. I'm just gonna sell my house and give it. Away. Yeah, like that's crazy, especially for someone who that's been their whole life story up until this point. My best guess is that Zacchaeus was probably pretty unhappy with his life. You know, you look at him in the text and it says he's wealthy, he's got that going on. And you're probably like, well, he's got a cushy job, he's rich, he's got this kind of thing. But, you know, he's probably at a point where he's like, I've amassed all this wealth, I'm balling, but I'm not happy, man. It's easy for us to jump in and quickly judge people who act in broken ways. People who are jerks, who are rude, who are doing awful things. And it's easy for us to say, that is, that is wrong. There's something wrong with that person. Usually, in my experience, I found that people who, are, who have broken actions are probably doing that because they're broken inside. And I think that Jesus took the time to pause and look past the actions and look at a broken man inside and say, he's lost. He's lost in his selfishness and he needs someone who will actually help him transform his life rather than come and just point out what he's doing wrong. I mean, everyone's been pointing out what he's doing wrong. And to me, that seems like something pretty transformative for Jesus to come and pause and understand Zacchaeus' interests and opinions in a way where it actually brought healing to his life and it actually helped fix the brokenness. Now, I'm throwing in some of my own flavor and assuming what the conversation is like, but I think that's what we can assume from what the text offers us. See, everyone's got a different story, right? I mean, everyone's got a different backstory up to where they're at now. We all live in different places, and we all have different jobs, and we all have different financial levels, and we all we come from different cultures and di- different norms and different family situations and, and, all, and all that. And it paints this unique narrative of who you are, and that's your context. And when you hear things and what you're going through now, you perceive it through that. It's so easy for us to just assume everyone probably thinks like me, and if they don't, they probably should. But they don't. I mean, most people weren't tax collecting like Zacchaeus. So the question is, why was he? And was anybody taking a moment to pause and come alongside him to to show empathy and and just kneel down and say, Zacchaeus, what's going on? I don't know what Zacchaeus' backstory is. I have no idea. I don't know if I'll ever know. Maybe Zacchaeus was bullied growing up. I mean, when I was growing up in church, we had a song about Zacchaeus. It's kind of all we knew about him. You know, Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he? Yeah, okay. If you know the song. Anyways, the whole song was framed around the fact that he's short. Like, we're still beaking this dude 2,000 years later for his height. Like, we're still picking on that guy. I don't know. Maybe that was his whole life growing up, and he's frustrated, and he's lashing out. Maybe he comes from a broken family or an abusive context. I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe it was good. What is it that's breaking him inside? And we're not going to know if we just assume that people should act and think the way that we do. Because if Zacchaeus were to say to Jesus, do you know where I'm coming from? Jesus would offer him an emphatic yes, because Jesus paused his interests and opinions long enough to understand Zacchaeus' interests and opinions. And you might say, well, yeah, well, obviously Jesus knows where he's coming from. And that's true. I mean, Jesus has a little bit of a leg up on us with knowing things. Uh, But we have this God-given ability to pause and to understand where people are coming from and to, to understand their context. And I think there are two kind of, there are a lot of challenges with that, but there are two really big challenges. It's so vital that we make it personal, because look at the life change in Zacchaeus' life. Imagine if we're fostering that kind of health and growth and healing in people's lives. But you hear me talking about pausing to understand people's context, to know where they're coming from, to know what's going on in their world, and you might say, Ryan, that sounds like a lot of work and time and energy that I don't have. And you're right, it does take a lot of time and work and energy. I mean, think about Jesus. I mean, at the start of Luke 19, what was going on? He was passing through Jericho. It doesn't, Luke doesn't write and say, Jesus was coming to Jericho and he was just like bored and looking for something to do. He needed something to fill his time. He's hungry. So he found this like short dude hanging out in a tree. It was like, hey man, you know, come on. I'm going to go hang out at your house. And Jesus was on his way somewhere. Jesus had a huge crowd. He had a lot going on in his life. Vocationally, Jesus was doing well and he could have prioritized other things, but he decided to pause and say, I care about this man, regardless of what other people think about him, I care about him and I wanna be personal with him and I wanna extend real love and empathy to this guy. One of the other challenges I think that we often presented with is the fact that this requires more than just our time, 
but it requires our vulnerability and our transparency. To understand where someone's coming from is to ask them to share some of the most personally intimate details of their lives with you. What, what's, what, what's hurting you inside? What makes you happy? What are your interests? What are your flaws? What's good? What, tell me about your family background, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We, we can't just walk into people's lives and say, hey, give that to me. I mean, you could try. I don't think it's going to foster the best results. I think one of the best things we can do is people who have been liberated by the love of Jesus Christ is to lead first with that kind of openness and transparency. Here's Jesus who is willing to just share his whole life with everyone. I mean, when we take that posture, we, we open up this conversation where we can make it very personal. It's hard for people to trust us with that, and one of the best ways we can foster that trust is to first extend that trust rather than demanding it from them first. To say, hey, listen, like, I'll, here's the good, the bad, the ugly of my life. I'll share it with you creates a lot more of a climate where people will say, sure, here's mine back. And then from there, man, the empathy, the compassion, the consideration that we can function with. You know, and we're relating this to our mission a lot, but I mean, just on a practical level, I mean, if you want good, deep relationships, lead with vulnerability, lead with transparency, lead with openness. Be willing to take the time to understand where people are coming from. You'll experience a depth that you've never experienced before. And maybe more importantly, they'll experience the love of Jesus Christ through you in a way that they probably never have before. Kind of with that said, and in light, kind of in the spirit of this series, I had decided that um, in my weeks in this series, I wanted to kind of share with you guys personally from my life, kind of made sense in a series called It's Personal. Um, so this week, and I'm preaching again in two weeks in case you set your vacation calendars around when I'm on, but um, the, uh, I want to share something from my life and um, in a couple of weeks, I don't think it's going to be anything too intense. This is going to be a little bit more real, kind of something that's going on right now that's kind of heavy. Um, and I, I, I just, I just want to say this before I, I share it with you. I've kind of gone back and forth this week about whether or not I should share this. And not because, like, I don't have any secrets from you guys, so it's, it's not that. I, I just really don't want this to turn a corner for the focus this morning. I, I'm not, I don't want to bring the focus to this. I want us to keep our, so if you guys can agree with me, we're going to keep our focus on this idea of what it looks like to follow Jesus' example of making it personal and understanding where people are coming from. Then I'd be happy to share this story with you. So here, here's where I'm coming from, and this has been helping me process this, this kind of idea of making it personal and how I engage with God and how I engage with others. Um, so a, a few months ago, like, Telsey and I, we often pray about you know, where our lives are headed and say, hey, God, what do you want us to do and all that. A few months ago, kind of through prayer, we, we had decided we we're having conversations, and we had arrived at this conclusion that we just we hate free time and we hate sleeping in so much that maybe we should have another kid. And so we decided, yeah, let's, let's give that a shot. So um, about uh, 10 weeks, I say about 10 weeks and one day ago, um, we found out that we, we had become pregnant and that Talsi was pregnant and we were very excited about that. And so we started telling family members and we started telling some people that are close to us in our lives and we're just like, man, we're so excited. We're gonna have this baby coming at the end of March, hopefully 11 days early so we share a birthday. Um, so then I can be even more reminded about how I don't get birthday presents at this point in my life. Um, and so we're so excited and we're so pumped. Um, about three weeks ago or something, we went to get our first ultrasound, and the ultrasound tech um, basically was like, yeah, like, you know, we're not seeing what we should normally be seeing, so it's not looking that good. And so then we had this series of uh, blood work, and well, we, I mean, I was there, she was doing all this stuff, but ultrasounds, blood work, everything, and found out that Talsi had miscarried the baby, and then all of a sudden this, this child that we're going to have that we're so excited about is just is not coming anymore and it was it was really hard and again I'm not I don't want that to become the focus but one of the interesting things that I've been reflecting on is we've been going through this time because now we have all these appointments we had to go to and decisions we had to make and this kind of loss that we were it was a tough emotional time and through that time I had some interactions with people that were either kind of tense or for different reasons were maybe not the greatest or whatever and I had to pause and think to myself, man, if they knew what I'm going through, I wonder if this is how they would be talking to me or not talking to me or responding to me or, or, or those kinds of things. And I'm not saying this this morning because I'm bitter or anything like that. They didn't know, so it's, it's all good. But it really started to make me think because I thought, if they really knew where I was coming from, what I'm going through right now, what my story is right now, I bet it would totally change the way that they spoke to me. 
or didn't or whatever. And so it made me think, well, I, what I found out through this is that miscarriages are really common. And I mean, I know I'm talking about something kind of sensitive, but like 18 to 20% chance if you get pregnant of having a miscarriage, that's like a one in five, that's huge. So I was thinking, man, like, do I take the time to consider that that could be happening that regularly in people's lives in the ways that I'm interacting with them in the ways that I'm knowing them? Do I pause my own interests and opinions to understand that people might be going through that? And that's just one example. I mean, how many other kinds of losses and tragedies and traumas and good things and bad things, all these things could people possibly be going through and how quickly do I just go in and interact as though they're in the exact same place as me and find it so hard to slow down and pause and come beside them and try to grow in empathy. Man, Jesus' example of this, he could have looked at Zacchaeus and been like, hey, Zacchaeus, I've heard about you. You're a loser. You are a dirtbag, and you should be ashamed of yourself. He's like, dude, I'm going to come hang out with you. Loves us, dude. Says, this is my mission, is people like this. Now, people don't have to be going through some crazy negative thing for us to decide we want to extend empathy. I think as Christians, that should be our posture if we want to be followers of Jesus, that we should extend this kind of empathy and try to understand where people are coming from. So this week, as you leave here by kind of way of application, I just want you to think about this. Take some times when you're talking to people, when you're having interactions with people, when you're thinking about people, when you're part of relationships in your life, and ask yourself, am I pausing? Or am I just doing my thing and expecting them to have the same cultural and economic and familial background that I have and have the same opinions I have? Take some time when you're talking to people and just pause. And say, how can I better understand where they're coming from so that I can make it personal? and help FBC as a family move forward as we lead people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ. Band's gonna come out, we're gonna sing another song, and I I just wanna throw one really quick thing out there. Um, At FBC, we talk about thinking small, we say, uh, and that means to engage in personal relationships here within our faith community. And one of the big ways we do that, not the only way, but one of the big ways we do that is through small groups. If you're here and you've never been in a small group, you're not currently in a small group, maybe you have a lot of reasons why you don't want to. Maybe you're like, I don't know, like I gotta like, I might not like the snacks or I might be busy or this, I, I don't know. Maybe life's crazy, maybe life's busy, I, whatever it is. I wanna encourage you, we're doing something this fall called Small Group Startup, and what it is, it's like a free trial, like a free sample, like you know, like when you go to Costco and they got the the samples and you eat it and pretend you're interested in buying the product that you're taking a sample of. Um, You do that, sign up and come try it out and pretend you're interested. If at the end you hate it, which I don't think you will, no obligation, but we'd love for you guys to try it out. If you don't know that much about small groups, if you have any questions or if you're even mildly interested, I'd love for you right after the service beside the info center is a booth for small group startup. Linnea's there. She'd love to get you signed up, talk to you about that, and see how this can help you in this journey of making it personal and engaging in intentional relationships here at FBC. Why don't you guys stand up? We'll pray and then we'll sing together. God, thank you so much that you are a personal God and that you love us so deeply. We are so fortunate to be able to know you. Please fill our hearts with the desire to make this mission to take your love to the world very personal and to be intentional in the way that we do so, to extend empathy, to care about people and to consider where they're coming from. We love you so much, God, and we're just thankful for this gift that you've given us and we ask that you would help us as we try to share it in the world around us. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen.